So on Tuesday, do you know what begins on Tuesday? <clears throat> the season for nonviolence. Very good. Did you catch wind of that at 9 o'clock or do you just know? <laughs> I didn't think you were. Yeah. So the season for nonviolence is a 64-day period, starts January 30th and ends April 4th. And what it is is a season to really bring forth nonviolent ways of being and seeing and doing and communicating. And it's marked on January 30th and April 4th by the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., two people who really brought forth the nonviolence idea and the movements that went with them. And so interestingly, it was actually started by the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. Arun Gandhi, and the Association for Global New Thought, of which unity is a part. So isn't that cool? That new thought was actually behind this, along in partnership with Gandhi's grand grandson. I love that connection. So it's, it's very uh, timely that we're doing the work that we're doing in the series and the class that we're doing around sovereign belonging. Dr. Brene Brown's recent um, book, Braving the Wilderness, because this work is very much about this way of being in the world, ahimsa, as Gandhi would say, the soul force, satyagraha, this idea that we bring forth the power of nonviolence, of peace, as a way of, in the face of everything, violence and, and everything else that's going on in the world, to be able to stand really in our divine selves and know that power. So that's a big part of the walk, and that chapter for this week happens to be, people are hard to hate, close up, move in. Isn't it true, though? When we get to know one another, when we learn about people's stories, when we get a little sense of their background, suddenly we come with a different kind of opening, right? An open, a more open mind, a more open heart, a kind of tell me more attitude. And that's really what we're up to, is moving toward that. So this week is really about that second principle of unity, this idea that we are innately divine, that we come in not by original sin, we don't buy into that, but by original virtue, virtue. If we are truly made in the image and likeness of God, there's nothing to clean up, right? We come in in that place of purity. We know this when we look at a child, right? A baby that's just been born, that otherworldly, pure love kind of sense that we have. It's like, ah, yeah, that's who I am. That's where I came from. So this innate divinity, this second principle in unity, is about recognizing that all people are divine, including ourselves. Let's not leave out ourselves, right? That all people are born of original virtue, and that it is our work, our practice, to see and behold that divinity in ourselves and in each other. That's really what we're about. So speaking of Gandhi, he has actually something to say about the face of God in this practice. He says, if you don't find God in the next person you meet, it's a waste of time looking any further. <laughs> so you can take that two ways, right? <laughs> One way is your work is to find it wherever you are, with whomever you're interacting, as difficult as that person may seem for you. Another way of looking at it is, Oh, no, if you can't find it in one person, it's probably nowhere to be found. <laughs> Hopefully, we're not going to take that tact. But what we will take is that it's serious work. It's practice. This is where the rubber hits the road when we're working, particularly this principle, because this one can challenge us in ways, and it seems to be challenging us in many ways in our world that, that we find sometimes insurmountable. But it isn't insurmountable. That's the good news. It's a high bar, our second unity principle. It's a high bar, this idea of divinity, right? And part of what comes with that bar when we look out into the social experience of the world, the collective humanity of the world, we can think of it as human dignity, you know? And raising up the dignity to that place of divinity. You know, we come in wired 
understanding that we care for each other. We come in wired uh, biologically as well as spiritually that we are a species that, that there's an instinct to survive, to take care of the tribe. We don't want anybody from the tribe to disappear, right? But as I think part of what's happened is as we have grown and grown and grown, now billions of us on this planet, the work has gotten a little harder, hasn't it? The wiring impulse to take care of one another seems to be getting a little cross-wired, <laughs> if you will. And so, so to go back to that initial impulse, that wiring, that we have compassion for all, that all are included in our moral ways of being. You know, we're wired to, to be kind. We're wired to be compassionate. We come in with this original virtue. It's who we are in truth. Everything we see that is something other than that is what we have forgotten, <laughs> where we have gotten amnesia about who we are, not only as a divine human, a divine being, but also as a human being, right? Just that basic dignity of humanity. So what has happened? How is it that we've gotten into the situations that we've gotten into? There's actually, it's been studied, and there's actually a dehumanizing process that we go through that sort of reprograms us in a way. And why do we even do that? Well, when we are in pain, right? when there is hurt, when there is anger, it can come out or be projected out because it's too hard for us to deal with it or we don't have the skills to deal with it. It can be projected out in hatred. right? And then what can happen is people will start to find others who are projecting out their hatred. And then a group gets identified. And so how is it that we could possibly exclude someone from this moral circle that we are wired to have for compassion and caring for all is because this pain gets projected out. And, and then when it gets projected out in groups and it gets projected to a group, we begin a process. It starts with words. And we start to name that group differently. We name them in ways that are subhuman in ways that are disparaging. Then we start to attach images to that and movements get, get born, hatred movements get born out of this process. And so pretty soon we have drawn a line that says we are people who are compassionate and caring and kind and we take care of one another and we are morally included except and we've got a group outside the circle. And this is how people justify in their minds the crazy things we can't imagine that get justified, the atrocities of, of torture, the atrocities of slavery, the atrocities of genocide. We say to ourselves, how could we ever go there? What went wrong? How did the wires get so crossed? This is how. Brene Brown brings us to a place where the, the rivers, um, the source of the river helps us. She says, how much longer are we willing to keep pulling, uh, to keep pulling, drowning people out of the river one by one, rather than walking to the headwaters of the river to find the source of the pain? Sorry, I threw off our slide people because I went somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry, John. We'll go back to that one. So how much longer are we going to do that, you know? We'll come revisit this idea of going to the headwaters of the pain. But let's do look at that, that slide that you had up, John, for a minute. Because Brene Brown, our author, is also telling us about finding that face of God. She says, in our, if our faith asks us to find the face of God in everyone we meet, that should include the politicians, the media, and the strangers with whom we most violently disagree. Because when we desecrate their divinity, we desecrate our own. And we betray our faith. So if we're really walking the line of this divinity, if we're really upholding this principle, if we're really bringing that dignity up to divinity, then, then we won't desecrate anybody's dignity or divinity, right? or betray our faith. I mean, they're strong words, but we need strong words for a strong time. You know, we need to really be kind of awakened, have that, that fire lit underneath us that says, wow, I'm betraying my own faith. 
I'm desecrating the divinity of another person by allowing that hatred to, to be inside of me too and to begin to project it out on this otherizing. So we too will find places within ourselves, even if we're walking a really earnest spiritual walk, where we are showing up that way too. Not to the maybe the degree of the kinds of atrocities we just talked about, but somewhere in that gray area, we can find ourselves, right? At times. So the problem is that we are in some ways, lowering our standards and lowering our standards collectively and don't really recognize it, right? Anne Lamont, a fr she's a humorous writer, one of her friends said that, by, that she was on a path to her own self-destruction and by the end she said, I was deteriorating faster than I could lower my standards. <laughs> <laughs> And we can kind of relate, right? Sometimes it feels that way. And sometimes when we cast our eyes upon what's going on in the world, it feels like as humanity, as a human family, we could sometimes feels like we're deteriorating faster than we can lower our standards. Do you ever feel that way? Yeah. The bar of dignity seems to get lower. And, and, the, and when we do that over and over again and we continue to cross that line, that says this is human dignity, it's the line that's not supposed to ever be crossed, and we keep crossing it, it becomes normal. And our new normal is a very, becomes a very low standard, maybe even to the point where there is no line anymore. We can't let that happen, can we? We won't let that happen. As people who are spiritually awakening, we won't let that happen, we can't let that happen. Because in our presence there is a light and a love and a compassion and an understanding and a constant work that's going on inside of us, right? We're constantly on that edge of evolving. And so even when we fall down, even when we forget, even when we recede into some of these ways of being that we'd rather not be, know that whatever those ill intentions that were around us that caused the spite or whatever it was that caused us to react in such a way, is just calling us up higher. It's reminding us again and again of who we are. When we see who we are not, and we feel that, oh, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I felt that. I can't believe I'm thinking that, that I'm spreading that negativity, you know? That I'm lowering, that I'm being a part of, that I'm joining the group who is lowering the standards, forgetting who we are. And so that's when we say, no, I won't. <laughs> I see the lines of human dignity and I raise them up to divinity because that's the truth of who we are and that's the truth of our path. That's what we're all about. So when Brene Brown talks about this idea of pulling ourselves, you know, not, don't, don't stand there, let's, let's, how long are we going to pull the drowning people out of the river, you know, before we finally realize, ah, we need to walk to the headwaters of the pain because that's what's underneath it, right? These people who do these crazy mass shootings, you know, they, they often report being lonely, being loners, right? And, and so you can imagine there's a lot of pain and a lot of sense of not belonging and then getting online and finding communities where they feel like, oh, I could join this group because that sounds like it's really empowering. And really what they're not realizing is that sounds like a group where I can project out all this hatred and anger, you know? So what do we do? We go to those headwaters. We go to those places. We defy the hatred. We let our best spiritual so selves rise up. Jesus puts the high bar out there. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's, that's where we're really aspiring, right? To really be that energy in the world where we can be in the face of that kind of persecution or that kind of otherizing or on the defense, and we can switch just like that into, I love you. <laughs> I pray for you. I bless you. Now, we don't always get there, do we? <laughs> so we can say, I won't give you my hate. I won't allow you that. 
Booker T. Washington said, I will let no man belittle my soul by making him hate me. By making me hate him, excuse me. I will let no man belittle my soul by making me hate him. I won't give somebody my hate because it belittles who I am. It takes me off course. It, it knocks me off the spiritual journey. It, it, it reels me back in my awakening, or so it feels. Right? I won't allow it. I won't let somebody belittle my soul in such a way. Antoine Larry was um, a person who lost his wife during a terrorist attack in Paris where 88 people died in a theater. And two days after the attack, he wrote an open letter to the terrorists. And he said this, you stole the life of an exceptional person, the love of my life, the mother of my child, but you will <coughs> not have my hate. I will not respond in anger. You want me to be scared to see my fellow citizens suspiciously? You have failed. You will not have my hate, and neither will you have the hate of my child. He had a 17-month-old son. Neither will you have his hate. In fact, he will defy your hate every day of his life that he lives happy and free. That's the kind of message and the strength two days after that happened. He could stand in that place and say, my soul will not be belittled. I will not hate. I will not go there. I will walk the path of nonviolence. I said path, but I said pact. <laughs> and it is a pact, isn't it? It's a pact that we make when we say and awaken to the fact that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. When we awaken to that truth and we realize who we are and we recognize the humility of, of what God has given us, the gift that God has given us of consciousness, of awakening, of the light and the love and the truth that we are, then there is nothing that can allow us to get off, off track. Maybe for a minute, but then we stand up in the, and on the big shoulders of people like Booker T. Washington and say, my soul will not be belittled. Or we stand on the shoulders of this man, Antoine Larry, and we say, ah, man, I see your pain. And I see that in your pain, two days later, the love of your life gone, your little 17-month-old son, and you can stand there and say, you will not have my hate. I will not lower the bar. I will not lower the standards. I will not erase the line of human dignity. I will not be one to participate in that process. That's the no. <laughs> and then there's a yes, right? Sometimes we forget, sometimes we fail, right? Sometimes we're in a place where we go to those places of, of anger, angry response or projection or even feelings of hatred or enemy. Maybe we even participate in some of this creating a common em enemy thing. You know, certainly been, seems alive and well in our political dialogues lately. And so if we find ourselves in those places, then we can go back to this place where we go to the headwaters of the pain, right? And we in, invite each other. Let's walk together to the headwaters of the pain that Brene Brown is suggesting we go to. And what do we find there? Well, we'll find the pain that's underneath all this stuff, right? We'll find a place of healing, but guess what we also find there? The source. At the headwaters, we find the source, the purest water, the purest healing energy, the purest love, the purest truth. It's odd that we, we do all these things to avoid the pain and the underlying stuff, and we create all this darkness in the world, and yet if we just walk together to the source of the pain, we could heal and see what's the truth of what's there. <laughs> Recently, I literally went to the headwaters of the Sacramento River near Mount Shasta, and there it was so beautiful. It was a city park, Mount Shasta City Park, and, and there were 
small pockets of people, but it was a very diverse gathering of people. And it's just an open park. You can go anytime, bring a wa bottle of water and fill it with this, the headwaters, the source of the Sacramento River, said to be pure and healing water, good to drink right there out of the river. How often do we get to do that without a filter and all kinds of craziness that we need to do? <laughs> And to be there, there was a man who was doing some ceremony there. I mean, people were just there on their own time. There was nothing planned, you know. There was a, a man with a gentle pit bull <laughs> sitting with him. There were indigenous people from the local tribe. And in and out, there were different people. As we walked around the park and came back, we noticed different people. There was racial diversity and age diversity. And everybody had just come there to the headwaters of the Sacramento River, right there in the city park, to get some pure water. But the energy was so clear and so clean. There was such a beautiful energy there. And that's what we find when we go to the headwaters of pain. Yeah, it may be painful at first and hard to look at. Wasn't the case here. We went right into the source. And so that's what we find when we go there. That's the truth. That's what we're all going with our, our, our little vessels to collect, right? A piece of God. A sense of this love and this purity and this clean, clear energy that we want to carry with us and we want to drink and we want to use for ceremony and we want to spread. It's all a metaphor for what we do when we are courageous enough to go to the headwaters of the pain of humanity, of ourselves, and take a look. It's never as bad as we think it's going to be. It's never nearly as bad as what we create by lowering our standards and erasing these lines of dignity and forgetting our divinity. So why go through all that <laughs> when we can just go right to the source, right? So the collective and the personal journey today seems to me, more, maybe more than ever, more than ever in my lifetime, at least to my awareness, is really interwoven. That's why we keep talking about these issues because they're top of our minds, bottom of our hearts, you know? Because it's, it's what we're carrying. And there's, there's pain in that, there's grief in that, it's present for us. And so our personal journey, all the work you've done, you're ready, you know? Every prayer you've said, every time you've sat meditation, uh, every book you've read, every workshop you've been to, every class you've been to, all the, the therapy maybe you've done or other work that you, personal work that you've done, every heartbreak, every breakdown, every breakthrough, every aha, every insight, you're ready. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You feel it? Enough already. We're ready. We're ready. <laughs> Count me in, God. I'm ready. Yeah. So wash away any ideas that you've got to go do the A, B, and C before you're ready. Because this is it, game's on, rubber hits the road. It's happening, you know? The world is happening around us. And some, day, some days it feels like the sky is falling, but we have the power to raise it up. And that's what our work is. So don't tell yourself I'm not ready. You are so ready. You know, it's like an athlete who prepares for a competition and the, the day of the game comes. It's like, well, I'm as ready as I'm going to be, Right? And that's the truth of, of where we are and who we are. These things would not be happening in the world if it wasn't a call to spiritual awakening. You know, so this is the good news. The good news is we are being shaken awoke. <laughs> the good news is whatever it is that's getting under your skin is actually an opportunity for the light to come out <laughs> and the love to come out and the truth to be known. Martin Luther King said, an individual has not started living until he can rise above or she can rise above the narrow confines of his or her individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. We can't walk the path alone anymore or just in our little bunkers of comfort can't do it anymore. It's not the world we live in anymore. And like it or not, it's what we signed up for in our lifetime or we wouldn't be here at this time. At some point, at some time, I believe, we made some kind of agreement that this would be the span of life 
that we would be here for. And so we can choose every moment of every day how we show up. And every moment we fall short, we can pick ourselves back up. But don't allow yourself to get, I want to say spiritually lazy, if that's okay. <laughs> you know, don't allow yourself to fall in, to, the, to get sucked into that life-sucking, to that spirit-soul-sucking kind of way of thinking and being an us and them kind of way of being. It won't serve anyone, including you. As quick as you can be awakened to it, move, raise it up, allow the truth to come forward for you. Our social fabric must be rewoven with spiritual thread. You know, and we are the weavers. <laughs> we are the sowers. You are the sowers of the wounds. And maybe you think, oh, I don't want to sow wounds. <laughs> but you can, and you have the tools, and you have the ability, and you have the knowledge. Exactly as you are today in this moment, you have the ability to do spiritual triage on this world. You have everything you need. Trust it. Walk into the headwaters. Look for the pain. Look at it. It's okay. It's not nearly as scary as what we, what we create to try to avoid it. And that alone heals. And rehumanize. You know, that's what the path we're on. We're not dehumanizing. We're not interested in that. We're interested in rehumanizing, right? Bringing back the dignity, raising the awareness of common dignity and common divinity. When we divinize, if that's a word, I'm going to make it a word today. Divinize. <laughs> we behold the Christ and the truth in one another. We walk the path of that practice, remembering again and again. And it, when we're, where we need um, the people who have gone before, we can reach to them and their inspiration and their wisdom. Mother Teresa is one of those. Mother Teresa said, Every day I see Jesus Christ in one of his distressful disguises. <laughs> if you walk out into the world every day as you, as you leave your home in the morning, maybe say, say something that allows you or, or pray something or know something, have some kind of ceremony that allows you to cross that threshold to say, I am moving toward the headwaters of the pain of the world to the source of love and healing. And I carry with me maybe the words of Mother Teresa. You can change the master teacher if Jesus Christ doesn't resonate for you. I myself love me some Jesus, so Jesus is just fine with me. <laughs> Every day, I see Jesus Christ in all his distressing disguises, or whoever you want, to guide you. What to do? What do I do? What do I do besides going to the headwaters of the pain and, the, and going to the headwaters of the source of healing and love? What do I do besides this rehumanizing and this ceremony? There's more. There's more we can do. We could practice generosity. Do you remember that acronym I showed you last week? It comes from the book, Brene's book, Braving the Wilderness. And the braving is for the elements of trust that we need to bring with us. And the G in braving is for generosity. Generosity meaning giving a generous, extending to others and to ourselves a generous interpretation of people's and ours intentions, actions, and words. You know, just giving that gift of generosity to give people a little space, you know, give people a little space and ourselves a little space to make mistakes, to not do things exactly perfectly or as skillfully as maybe we wish to, but to know we're all doing the best we can. There was a waitress and a man came in who had lots of bags and he smelled and he was taking up a lot of space and he took up a whole booth and it was a busy day for this waitress and she was already feeling kind of irritated and she was trying to do her job and this man was asking her all these questions. He finally got the menu out, and he's looking at the menu, and he says, how much is the breakfast special? And she says, $7, sir. And he's fumbling around for his money, and he's taking all this time, and she's getting more and more irritating as she's watching customers come in. 
And, she, and he says, how about a sandwich? How much is a sandwich? She says, sir, it depends upon which sandwich. Look at the menu and, you know, I'll come back and take your order, okay? So she goes and she waits on some other people. She comes back around and he says, how much for the bacon and egg sandwich? She's like, four dollars. And he looks at his money and he looks at her and he thinks for a minute and he says, how about the egg sandwich? And she says, three dollars. And he says, yeah, okay, I'll take the egg sandwich. So she brings it, he takes a long time eating, which irritates her even further. She doesn't even go check on him again. She just waits on everybody else. Finally, she's thinking, he's checking out, so he's leaving. So she's beginning to clean up his table, and she stops dead in her tracks, because on the table is a $1 tip. And she says to herself, this man was making room for me. And I made no room for him. Not a shred of room in my heart for him. And he was calculating to make room for me. That's generosity. And so we never know who it is that is going to bring us the spiritual lesson of the day. But if we are open, we can receive it. <laughs> and if we ourselves decide that we will be the bringer of generosity, well, all the more will we be blessed over and over again because we know how that works. Dr. Michelle Buck is a professor of leadership at Northwestern University, and she talks about not conflict resolution, but conflict transformation. Because she says conflict resolution indicates that we're going back to some place of comfort that we had before. But conflict transformation says that we are creating something new, that we are having creative conversation to bring forth something new. And she says one of the keys to practicing this is to say, tell me more and then listen. And so when, just at that point in a conversation when we're ready to turn away or we wanna end the conversation or we're gonna counter with somebody something that we really wanna get our opinion out there, she said that's the golden moment to say, tell me more and then listen. This is one of the key ways, tell me more and then listen. And isn't that what we are moving out into the world to do? To listen, to say, tell me more. To go to that place of the headwaters of pain. To rehumanize, to raise up that line of human dignity so it merges with the truth of our divinity. That's what we're about. That's the walk. That's the path. That's our work this week. Let's close out with an affirmation. Together, I move closer to difference and listen with my heart. I walk the path of dignity and divinity. And so it is. <laughs>